Hey y'all, I'm Reggie Mobley, for those of you don't, who don't know me, and for those of you who do, I'm still the same guy. Uh, it's good to see y'all, and I just wanted to have, bring to you a few pieces of music that are really important to me and I think that should also be important to you. I'm starting with a piece that some of you may know, it's My Lord, What a Morning, which is a traditional spiritual. And I start with this before going into Baroque music because I strongly feel and understand that slave songs and Negro spirituals, because they were written, and they're written at a time early in our history as Americans, this music is early music too. So I want to start with what I started with as a child and what we started with as a country and as a people. And from here we'll move on to some music you may also know from across the pond.
Hello, my name is Julie Griffin. I'm Director of Artistic Operations here at Music of the Broke and a proud lover of the Strong Voices program. We are so thrilled to have you with us, Reggie. And what can you tell us about countertenor voice and how you produce it and how it came about and just general information about being a countertenor? Well, the countertenor voice is basically the thing that allows me to pay rent. Um, but really, it's... It's basically a, a reinforced falsetto voice that we use that we use in singing, and it we basically use our head voice, our chest voice, and our falsetto to kind of create this kind of seamless sound, uh, this voice classification that fits higher than what you you would hear from a typical male classical singer like a tenor or baritone. Effectively, what I sing is an alto part. And there are some who sing soprano, if you've heard the group Chanticleer. Um, it's all along the spectrum and all along the range. And I've done it for you know many years, and there have been many containers who've come before. And what we do now is because of the existence of uh, boy singers and choirs like boy altos and boy sopranos, and also the castrati, a lot of containers tend to focus on music that was written for male singers in that range in the Baroque and classical period. But the thing is, is that even though it seems kind of unique for me to exist as a countertenor in classical music, the truth is, is that everyone has always known and heard people who sing like this. If you've heard Prince, if you've heard Michael Jackson, if you've heard, you know, the Gibbs, like if you've heard, you know, any of these pop singers who sing in that higher range, or if you just heard Barbershop, that's basically what a countertenor does, what a countertenor is. Because I was taught that everything that comes out of your mouth is your voice. Everything that comes from you is yours. So there's nothing strange or odd about it, but it's actually just the most easy, it's easiest way for me to express music. And so this is the voice I use. Just wanted to ask you some questions to hopefully address things that the students might be asking. So I guess my first question is, what inspired you to become a professional singer? When did you first decide 
oh, this is what I want to do? Well, oddly enough, I didn't. Uh, I wanted to be an artist. So my high school, uh, in, I grew up in Gainesville, Florida. My high school was, an, was a magnet school for drafting and architecture. And so I was in the architecture program. And from there, I actually halfway through transitioned to just visual arts. So I was in the APR courses and I took the art exam. I got, you know, I, I aced it. Um, ended up with a full scholarship, a full ride to a college for graphic art and design. And it was that last year of high school that I just happened to add a choir class as well, just to fill out my schedule. And I got to sing in a barbershop quartet. I got to sing Purcell and all these other things. And I really started to fall in love with music um, all over again. I played trumpet in, in middle school, but dropped it after that. And so at the very last minute, I applied at an HBCU, Historic Black College University, Oakwood College in Huntsville, Alabama, and they matched my art scholarship for music. So I took an immediate left turn after high school and went to college on a trumpet performance scholarship. I didn't touch the trumpet a single day. I immediately took voice lessons and just started singing. And from there, everything just fell into place. Ignatius Sancho is an incredible composer. He was born on the slave ship headed to the New World. His, both of his parents died, and he was then taken to England, where he was sold to two sisters. From there, he learned to read, write, and play music, and became good friends with the Duke of Montague. Through his help, he then became this wonderful composer, this wonderful writer, and eventually a shopkeeper, where he then became the first black person to vote in parliamentary elections in the UK. Ignacio Sancho, his letters are incredible, and you can read about them these, today. Um, his book is found everywhere, and he also wrote a treatise on music. What is important about him is that he is an incredible composer who wrote many songs and reels and galliards that, that were part of the literati, part of the society in London where many people got together and danced and had fun and, and basically partied. Um, two of these pieces, which are really, really special, I want to sing for you right now. One, The Complaint and Friendship, Source of Joy. Yet still, yet still, we hug our chain. Yet still, yet 
Well, you talked about different kinds of music. You know, I'm, I've heard you talk about barbershop. I know that you've done some other things. Can you tell us about what other kinds of music you like to sing? Absolutely. Well, being born and uh, raised in the South, um, every black countertenor from the South has the same origin story. We all started as a little cherub choir in our little black church somewhere, you know, deep in the sticks singing gospel. And that's, I mean, it's a broad brush and it's kind of purplelized, but it is true. I sang in a gospel choir and I and that's carried with me my entire life. I still love singing gospel. I still love singing spirituals. Um, I still, I sing quite a bit of jazz. Um, I sang musical theater for a while and I do occasionally, if I can, sing with my old barbershop quartet. I mean, there's, to me, there is no difference between barbershop and jazz and Baroque and even country and blues. Like, Music is music. It's meant for us. It's meant for people. And it's meant to express emotions and help us to communicate and relate to each other a lot better. So it's all in me and always will be. Though I want to continue on with this vein of incredible composers of color uh, of early music, we do finally get to leave England, and now we head to France. Joseph Boulogne, or otherwise known as Chevalier de Saint-Georges, was an incredible composer, but not just a composer, but a writer, a writer, a shooter, an incredible master fencer. He was everything. Uh, President John Adams considered him the most accomplished man in all of Europe. That's a lot for a composer that very few people know. But the truth is, is that Chevalier Saint-Georges was well known in France at the time. He was the tutor to Marie Antoinette. He knew Mozart very well. As a matter of fact, we think that uh, Chevalier Saint-Georges uh, developed this uh, symphony concertat style that Mozart then copied and even quoted him uh, 11 years later. Uh, he was not just an incredible person during that time and became the Chevalier de Saint-Georges by the way of Louis XV, but also during the French Revolution, he led the first all-black regiment and was decorated heavily for it. He was an incredible composer and a story that we should all know and celebrate even today. So, I have one more piece for y'all. One more piece by Handel. And I hope that you will enjoy this because I'm pretty sure that you've heard this and you might know this.
Um, we're ending on this because it takes a man with, who can do a mighty strong flex to start an entire opera with a king singing about a tree. This is Ombra Maifu, or as you may know it, Handel's Largo. Uh, when you were last with us in the concert hall at the Harris Theater in May of 2019, you may have remembered that there was about 250 strong, strong voices um, <laughs> choir that sang Come Ye Sons of Art I before do. the concert started. And, and it was wildly, wildly successful. I, I think the audience, were, they were on their feet <laughs> after those kids sang. Um, one of the interesting things, we did a survey, as we usually like to do to find out, you know, how we can better mold the program, is we asked kids what they thought about the concert. And there were several kids who said, it was a wonderful concert, the music was wonderful, but what was amazing was seeing you, Reggie, on stage because they look like me. He looks like me. And I didn't think that was possible. In this day and age, what do you think we can do so that we can be more inclusive and we can make our concert halls as diverse as our society is? I think making sure that stages do look more like me. I think there for so long, um, classical music and early music, well, classical music in general has been kind of treated as this last bastion, this kind of walled country club, this gated community. And many people have said that we should be more inclusive, which is absolutely correct. And the problem is, is that if you for so long lock the doors, lock the gate, keep people that look like me out or make us feel not included, if you unlock the door, we still think the door is locked. So it's important to not just unlock the door, but to open the door and welcome, welcome us inside. It's important to realize that this music is for all of us, and, and, and it doesn't have to be a fluke like it was for me to get into classical music. The, the, the next Leontine Price, the next Pavarotti, the next Jones Hogan, the next me is in these schools. It, you know, they're out there, and they just need someone to say, don't be afraid. This is not elitist. This is not unwelcoming. This is yours. Music is a gift for all people. It can't 
be owned. Sound can't be owned, truly. And something like this that really does belong to everyone, we need to do our part. We need to do better to make them feel welcome, to realize that, that they are part of this. That, and then not just by putting me on a stage or putting several black musicians or musicians of color on stage, but also that the the board, also the, you know, the staff, also the music that we sing. The fact that I sang Sancho and Price and Xavier San George shows that that people of color have, despite all notions, have always had a seat at the table. It's just that someone's been sitting in it. And it's time for us to realize that and take our place, to realize that, that we are not outsiders coming into music, beautiful music like this. We've always been a part. We always will be a part of it. And that it's important for us to, to get some onus and take responsibility and be where we're, we're allowed to be. Whether we want to or not, it's ours for the taking. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you um, to all the Strong Voices kids out there. We're really glad that you could join us for this wonderful recital. Thank you, Reggie. Thank you.